You know, affair is a word we hear a lot. And sometimes people say it in such a lighthearted way that you think, well, affair, it sounds like something that's nice to do. What a nice little affair. Yet most of the time when people in our culture use the word affair, they mean unfaithfulness. I'm in a relationship with one person and I have violated that by having a relationship with another person. Let's talk about that. I'm Dr. Joe Beam with Marriage Helper International, and this is Kimberly Holmes, our CEO. So, Kimberly, how would you define an affair? I would say that an affair is a breach of the marital contract, specifically when it comes to being involved with another person. Okay, does that mean just sexually involved with another person? Nope, it could mean emotionally or physically. Physically meaning sexually or what? No, I think it could be less than sexually. So what do you mean? Give me an example. Well, so I believe an affair could range from anywhere to it's an inappropriate relationship with someone who is not your spouse. And so that could be hand-holding, any kind of touching, kissing, of course, sex, but it could also be texting. It could be a really deep friendship. It could be anything to where that person begins to take a high level of, of uh, uh, that person begins to take a high role in your life. Okay, but handholding wouldn't necessarily mean that. Uh, with the right intention, it does, absolutely. Oh, but suppose I'm speaking somewhere and some old friend of mine walks up and, and she says, hi, Joe, and I'm walking to the front. She just grabs my hand and we talk as we get to the front and then she sits down and that's the whole matter of it. Is that an infidelity? Is that an affair? What was the intention behind it? I assume just friendship. Well, I think that's what goes into it, right? I mean, in in most instances, it's not going to be like, I can't think of hardly any situation in my life unless it's an older person to where it's going to be okay that we're, <laughs> that we're holding hands. But the bigger issue is going to be Is it something I'm wanting to happen? Do I like it? Am I going out of my way to try and get that to happen? Is it leading to something deeper in that relationship, which should only be between me and my husband? So if I'm hearing you correctly, you're saying what makes it an affair is the motivation, not specifically the action. Well, I kept saying intention, but yes, motivation. Okay, motivation, intention. Because it's not unusual after one of our workshops that women will, will hug me with a big bear hug. Sure. Because of what it did for their relationships and that kind of thing. Right. So it's the intention behind it. Right, because it's one thing to hug someone that you've been at a conference with for three days. It's another thing where you have gotten to have feelings for someone and then you're sitting outside of work after everyone's gone and you hug. Yeah, I remember uh, a particular situation I dealt with a few years ago where that she finally, her husband was a pastor and she finally decided to follow him one night because it's like, where are you going? What are you doing? And he was in the back of a cemetery parked Another woman had parked her car there and was in the car with him, and they were kissing when she walked up. And her her husband chastised her for interrupting his counseling session. Literally, that's what he did. And when she went to the elders of her church, they chastised her for interrupting his counseling session. He was kissing the woman? Apparently. At least least something more than just sitting in the car. Oh, my yeah, I would think that's a problem. But I would think even sitting in a car in the back of a cemetery in, yeah, in the nighttime, is, if they're not even touching each other yet, would be you're violating the covenant. You're violating the, the relationship you have with the person that you're married to, yeah. even if you're just sitting in a car in the middle of the dark in the back of the cemetery. Yeah, nothing about that is sounds But some people would good. say, no, it's only an affair if they have sex. It's not an affair if these other things happen. So what we're talking about is a violation of the covenant, yeah. a violation of the relationship, which obviously happens if a person has sex, but it could be what people call an emotional affair. It, it can be any number of things, mm-hmm. and you don't have to wait for it to be sex. Nor should you. <laughs> I concur, nor should you. But you realize a lot of even very strongly religious people would argue with us about that and say you're wrong. It's only an affair if it involves sex, and if it stops short of sex, then it wasn't a sin. There's a reason that affairs are a problem. And if you ask someone who's been cheated on, I guarantee you they're not going to say it was the moment they had sex that became a problem. It was something way before that that was hurting the relationship.
Yeah, I agree. When I was teaching human sexuality at a local university as an adjunct professor, uh, I kept trying to tell my class there, and some of them are arguing with me about it. I said, you know, your spouse has cheated on your relationship. If, if you walk up on him or her after work and they're sitting in the car in the parking lot kissing, they already are, are violating that. In my sense of the word, that's an affair. And I would have students argue with me, no, 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 and not at all. Believe it or not. I yeah. cannot wrap my mind. I feel... Honestly, I feel like the only time someone's going to argue with that is if they're wanting the pass for them, because no one's going to want to argue that to let their spouse to be able to do that. They just want the permission to do it. I think that's probably right. All right. So if an affair is happening, your spouse is involved with somebody else, either romantically, emotionally, sexually, then why would a person try to save a marriage like that? I mean... Probably all of your friends, your neighbors, even your relatives are going to say, kick him to the curb, kick her to the curb, divorce, get out. What would be reasons for trying to stay in a relationship if your spouse has cheated? We know that divorce carries a bunch of negative consequences in and of itself. Now, you should not stay in a marriage just to avoid the consequences of divorce, Mm -hmm. but it's something to consider. Also, we know from the work that we've done with thousands of marriages affected by an affair that it does not always mean, actually, typically, it does not mean at all that this person who had the affair is a bad person. Many times, it means that they got involved with someone at a time, whatever led to the circumstances, into something that they're actually a good person and want to be free of, maybe not in the moment, but they can be restored and the marriage can be made great again. And so, we like to encourage people to fight to save it and put it back together because the restoration of it can be more powerful and bring a better relationship and marriage and family than just divorcing because of the affair and trying to move on and finding a new spouse, which is Mm going to bring its own set of complications and problems. It it always does. Now understand that if you find your spouse is having an affair and you want to divorce them, that's your right. You can do that. And we're not sitting here in condemnation of that. What we're trying to point out is that sometimes even really good people can do some really bad things because none of us is perfect. We're all flawed. Now, that doesn't justify the affair, even if it's what's called the so-called emotional affair. We're not justifying that. We're not saying it's okay. We're not saying it's a bad thing. It is a bad thing. But before you decide to end the relationship, sometimes I think it makes sense for you to stop and ask the question, is my spouse a good person doing a bad thing? Where's my spouse a bad person doing a bad thing? Now, if they're just bad people, I mean, they keep doing all kinds of things wrong. At heart, they're bad people. You probably should have never married them to begin with, and rescuing that marriage might not be the thing you should do. But if they're good people, really good people can do some really bad stuff. And sometimes it's very much worthwhile to do whatever you can to rescue not only the marriage, but in the process of rescuing the marriage, you're actually rescuing that person. So Kimberly, if a person's in an affair, Mm -hmm. how do they get out? That's a great question. At some point, it's going to require a decision to leave. However, like we've discussed in previous episodes, there's a lot going on inside the brain and body that make that incredibly difficult to Mm -hmm. just up and do Mm -hmm. one day. So you know more about this than I do, I'm sure, from personal experience, but the work Mm -hmm. you've done with many other people and then also all of the research. I mean, there's a process to this. There's kind of a process of how an affair ends. Probably the majority of people don't wake up the next day unless they've had a major conviction or Mm -hmm. or break bottom point. They typically Mm -hmm. don't wake up the next day and just say, that's it, it's over. There's typically a process that leads to ending an affair. Typically so, because when the emotions are still extremely strong and powerful, Overcoming that emotion with logic is almost impossible to do. Some people have said, well, can I get my physician to prescribe something that can help me deal with those overpowering emotions? And the answer is, yeah. If uh, there is a study, I've read it, that if your physician found it worthwhile for you, medically speaking, to give you high dosages of an SSRI, a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, like Zoloft, for example, that that if you take that, it can help you in the affair because it's going to numb you out emotionally. But understand, it's going to numb you out emotionally about everything and everybody. You wouldn't even feel the same level of intensity for your children because you literally numb out for a while. 
But can that be done then to help a person get over that? Yes, that can work if you're willing to do that and if your physician is willing to write that kind of prescription. When you finally do get to the point, whether it's you've gone through the process or not, uh, or whether you've had help medically, whatever it might be, or, or counseling therapy. <clears throat> oh, and by the way, if you're counseling or therapy, avoid any counselor or therapist that encourages the affair. Mm-hmm. Just avoid those people, please. But finally, if you can get to the point where you can make a decision, your emotions might not be all in control yet, but enough in control that you can now make a decision. We strongly recommend you do the following. Make sure your spouse knows about the affair, of course, and we'll talk about in a minute how to do that. But then you write a letter to the person that you've been involved with where you state clearly and in brevity. You're not going to write paragraphs. You're going to write just a few sentences. And basically, you're going to say, this was wrong. I shouldn't have done it. It's over. Please don't contact me again. I'm not going to contact you again. Let your spouse read the letter. Let your spouse actually address the letter let your spouse mail the letter so that your spouse knows that it actually went. Then, if you need to, you change your cell phone number. If you're saying, boy, that's awfully inconvenient. Well, having the other person continue to contact you can be actually a lot more inconvenient. You make it where the other person can't get to you and that you don't go to them. And then you create accountability. So that your spouse can know where you are, what you do, what phone calls you make, what emails you send, as much as you can without violating confidentiality. For example, you may not be able to share your work email, that kind of thing. But you do those steps. Now, will you, if you do those steps, occasionally think, ah, I really want to call and check on the other person. I really want to see how he or she is doing. I just, I just want to hear their voice again. That's not unusual for those emotions to reemerge. Please don't do it. If you feel that, go to your spouse. Tell your spouse, I, right now, I'm feeling that kind of weakness. Can you help me work through it? But Kimberly, that presupposes that they're able to tell the spouse about the affair to begin with. Now, they may have been caught first, mm-hmm. and now they have to tell the spouse about it now that they're caught. Or it may be they're confessing and they haven't been caught. What kind of things do you think would be crucial when they're discussing this with the spouse? hmm I know that it is important that they don't share, they need to share enough to rebuild trust, accountability, and to show that they're being transparent, but not enough information that it is too overwhelming for the spouse who's hearing the information for the first time. So, so for example, nothing that creates a visual. Nothing that creates a visual. Those typically do not help. Okay. So we're saying be open and honest, be as transparent mm-hmm. as possible. Uh, when I left, Alice, my wife, divorced her back all those years ago to go be with another person. And then three years later, I came back and asked Alice if she would forgive me and take me back. That required me to let Alice know that I was sorry for what I had done Mm -hmm. and that I would give her enough information where she felt that nothing was being hidden from her. Mm -hmm. But the deal I made with Alice was this, and we still think it's a good idea. I said, if you want to know something, I'll tell you, but you need to make sure that you really want to know it. Because once I tell you, I can't untell you. And so I would ask Alice, are you sure you want to know that? If she said yes, I would tell her. Sometimes it would hurt her to hear it. Sometimes it would hurt me to say it out loud. Other times she would say, no. But if ever I do, will you tell me? Absolutely. Absolutely, I will. We had to get to the point where she felt that I was hiding nothing from her. Now, by the grace of God, she didn't ask any questions to create a visual. And, and we really strongly advise against that. But Kimberly, isn't there such a thing as if I tell my spouse I'm sorry, if I continue to do that repetitively, I'm sorry, I'm sorry over a period of time, can I actually program both of us to think that I'm no good? Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So how many times should I say I'm sorry? Well, that's a, that's a good question. Ideally, you would say it once, but it would be so powerful and impactful that the other person would know you mean it. And I think that's the key here. It's not, there's two parts of this. There's the, I need to apologize and feel forgiven. But then there's also the part of the other spouse saying, I need to know that you truly feel a repentance for what you feel a 
that you feel convicted about what you have done and that you want to repent. You're going to turn. You're not going to go back and do that again. And so it, we have a process that we take people through. Part mm-hmm. of what we teach in our workshop and part of the aftercare that follows the workshop that helps couples do this well mm-hmm. so that it can be done kind of a once and for all type of thing. Yeah, it's a step by step by step about mm-hmm. how to do this. Mm-hmm. And we teach people that. The, the thing I suggest is be honest. Be open, be transparent, try the best you can to understand the pain your spouse feels. Mm-hmm. Now, you'll never completely understand it, but sometimes they'll need to talk about it more than once. Mm-hmm. But I wouldn't comp- uh, repetitively say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I would say very much, I'm sorry. I hate that I did that. I hurt you, et cetera. But then the next time it comes up, rather than continuing to say things that begin to make me look like I am not trustworthy, I would say things like, yes, I know that hurt you deeply. I'm so happy that will never happen again. If it comes up again later, I can say things like, yes, yes, I so regret that happened, Mm -hmm. but now I know better. You're still saying I'm sorry, but without beating yourself up verbally. Now, there's a whole other thing here we don't have time to get into. Maybe we can do a future episode on is how do I forgive that? Mm -hmm. And then a part of that would be, and how do I, the perpetrator, the one who did the bad thing, how do I feel forgiven? But right now we're out of time, so What can we do right now to help people who are watching or listening? Well, I want to share a story of hope that just recently happened with a one of our solo spouse workshop graduates. And this woman stood for her marriage for, I mean, a couple of years. Her husband had been involved in an affair and he ended up coming back sending an email to his wife and to the affair partner, that short email Joe was talking about saying, it's over. We're done. He committed to coming back to his wife and he's committing to rebuilding the marriage with her. And so even though he had been involved in an affair for a couple of years, and even though his wife felt like there was absolutely no hope and was considering giving up her stand, she did all of the right things. And it just shows if you do the work, if anything works, this is what can work. And so we love seeing those stories of hope, those testimonials every time we get to see them. And so we can help you and hopefully your marriage be restored, even if an affair has been even if an affair has affected your marriage. And the most powerful way we can do that is through one of our three-day workshops that we have. We have options for the couple. We also have that solo spouse workshop. If you just can't get your spouse to agree to go with you, we have a version of the workshop specifically for you. And you can find out more about that by going to marriagehelper.com slash workshop. You can also get started, get in the marriage helper system and get started in what you need to do to turn your marriage around and to get your spouse back by going to marriagehelper.com slash free. And there you get access to a free three part mini course that teaches you all of the ways in three videos. (laughs) It teaches you the beginning parts of the things that you can do to really bring your spouse back, attract your spouse back, get your spouse back in order to restore your marriage. And you get all of those free by going to marriagehelper.com slash free. Over the decades we've been doing these workshops, we've helped a lot of couples uh, work past infidelity, put their marriages back together and make them strong again. Not just infidelity, but all kinds of problems. We hope that you check out our workshops and see what we can do for you. Thank you for being part of this episode of Relationship Radio. Kimberly and I will see you in another episode soon.